job. Asleep on the job. The toll collector. The radio announcer. A park ranger, armed and unconscious. Hello, you know, wake up. You don't get to be a shark by snoozing. You snooze, you lose. Then, an ambulance driver dancing at the wheel? Look, Ma, no hands. Not so funny when the 911 operators hang up on you. Are you going to give me an ambulance? Are you going to swear again, you stupid Can I get some help here? Then, a movie director determined to get a shot on a train trestle. A young camera assistant eager to do her job. And video released today of the accident that ended her life. We all had to basically run for our lives. She was doing her job. What about him? For them to overlook something is absolutely, positively, it's unacceptable. A story that will put Hollywood on trial. Rolling, rolling. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening, and it's great to have you back. It's great to be back. And tonight, 2020 on the case. The outrage over people being lazy, slacking off, not doing their jobs. Just this week, that video going viral, the UPS man kicking that $12,000 package. Whatever happened to handle with care? You might be thinking we all know someone at work who isn't pulling their weight, but tonight, what if not doing your job costs someone their life? Chris Conley up first here with the moment on the train tracks, leaving many asking, whose job was that? Follow the muddy waters of the Altamaha River westward, past the Spanish moss and the cypress trees in backcountry Georgia, and the river brings you to a century-old train trestle. Here, this February, a film crew would gather to shoot a movie's first scene. But the set would quickly turn into a place of real-life horror. Just kept saying over and over, Lord help us, God help us, Lord help us. On the film crew, put in harm's way, this young woman would suffer an all but unimaginable fate just for doing her job. She fell in love with the camera. She was Sarah Jones, raised in South Carolina without showbiz connections. She earned her film crew stripes during an internship in Charleston on Army Wives, as her parents Richard and Elizabeth remember. Why do you think she was drawn to the camera department? It's a challenge of it, I think. I think it, for, the, for the most part, it's man's world, and I think that was a little bit of a challenge to the her. Competition. Sarah Jones would become a camera assistant, the last sight the camera would see before a scene began. For multiple seasons on The Vampire Diary. This guy doesn't know that you're a vampire. Let's keep Such going. stars as Nina Dobrev and Ian Summerhalter knew Sarah well. Sarah, the first time I saw her, I mean, she was literally right in front of my face. She was doing the slate. You couldn't help but notice Sarah Jones. You are great. I just always wanted to be around her. She always had a smile on her face and was just the uber professional. She was my sister, you know? She was my cosmic sister. Even on the vacation she loved, Sarah Jones liked setting up her shots just so. She always was up for anything. She wanted to do bigger things, go to new countries, work on features and get her name out there. And rolling, rolling! In search of those opportunities, she'd leave Vampire Diaries in May of 2013. Soon, a huge break. Getting hired on the Fast and the Furious 7, as her parents were called. She was in the position she was striving so hard to be in. Get her foot in the door on the feature film. But then, a tragedy with a star. Paul Walker, one of the stars of the enormously popular Fast and Furious movies, dead in a car crash. Production would be postponed for months. So Sarah took her own fateful path, taking a camera assistant gig based out of Savannah on the movie Midnight Rider. Based on the memoir by Greg Allman of the Allman Brothers, starring Oscar winner William Hurt, Midnight Rider would be an independent film, written, produced, and directed by this man, Randall Miller. Sarah mentioned to me that it is a, a low-budget film, and she was a little bit surprised that 
some of the people did not have the level of expertise that she expected. Shooting had yet to begin on the film when, on Thursday, February 20th, cast and crew drove two hours to this location in Doctortown, Georgia. Among those arriving were Sarah and hairstylist Joyce Gilliard. I was told that it wasn't actual principal photography. The actual day we're supposed to start shooting was going to be that Monday. A pre-shoot, that's what it said on the schedule. But once they got there, the crew realized Randall Miller wanted to shoot a full scene. A dream sequence in which Greg Allman, from his hospital bed, imagines his late brother, guitarist Dwayne Allman, across the bridge. Two trains passed by, one at 3.45 in the afternoon. It came time to set up for the day's money shot, 30 feet above the water. The plan for the scene was to set up a hospital bed on train tracks. You've got a hospital bed, you've got heavy camera equipment, and an entire crew loaded onto this train trestle. Joyce Gilliard heard someone telling those assembled what to do if a train was spotted. You have 60 seconds to get off the track. I was more or less 60 seconds to get off the track. And I started praying. I'm mad at myself because I didn't say something. There was no onset medic. There were no railroad officials present. Location manager Charlie Baxter was not there. Moments after filming began, just before 4.30 p.m., this dream sequence turned into a nightmare. I don't know who yelled anything. All I know, I heard and I saw the train. And you just immediately started running. CSX train Q12519 with two locomotives and 37 freight cars barreling down the track at an estimated 57 miles per hour. I saw the light of that train. It was like the train was right there. So you had seconds to figure out what you were going to do. Sarah was trying to get the equipment off the track, as a good camera person would, because it's expensive camera equipment. Cast and crew had to run toward the oncoming train along this narrow pathway to save their lives. Joyce saw Randall Miller and another crew member trying to yank the hospital bed off the tracks. When I realized that I could not get to land, that's when I ran to the side and held on to the iron girder, and I prayed I didn't get hit by the train. The pressure from the wind from the train was so strong that holding on to the girder, I wasn't able to, it pulled me off. The train struck Joyce Gilliard's left arm after smashing into the hospital bed, shrapnel flying everywhere. Joyce closed her eyes. I couldn't believe what was happening. Thought about dying. And my family getting that call. The train's impact had snapped a bone in Joyce's left arm. Blood poured from the wound. Joyce opened her eyes once more. Sarah was the first person I saw. She was lying on the side of the tracks dead. You didn't know it was her. You didn't know it was her. I received a phone call from one of the, her friends. She said, Sarah's no longer here. I said, what do you mean? You mean as in dead? She said, yes, ma'am. It was rough. I mean, I, I, it took the wind out of me. It's very, very, very hard. Sarah Jones was 27 years old. Hours later, the phone rang again. It was the director of Midnight Rider. Randall Miller called us that day. He was very upset. He was crying. He was nearly hysterical. And he was, he was saying, I'm so, so sorry. He couldn't say much more than that. 
But why had Randall Miller allowed his crew to shoot on live tracks? Sarah Jones's parents and police demand answers. As allegations emerge of Randall Miller's reported recklessness on another film. He would say, but we're trying to make a movie here. As if that outweighed the needs or the safety or the welfare or of other people. It was like that's some kind of magic card. And footage released today from a camera mounted on the locomotive shows those last horrifying moments as the crew members of Midnight Rider scramble for their lives. Stay with us. Do your job continues. Once again, Chris Connolly. After the hideous accident on the trestle bridge above the Altamaha River in rural Georgia, there was a silence as scary as what had come before. At first, it was like a quiet, like people were in shock. I remember hearing somebody say, oh my gosh, she's dead. The horrifying news that 27-year-old camera assistant Sarah Jones had been killed by a train on the set of the film Midnight Rider reached her good friends on the Vampire Diaries just a few hours after it happened. And I got the call. It was just sat in the car going to set, and it was just pure shock. She just left too soon. She definitely, she had, she would have been, yeah, it was just too soon. I've been working as an actor pretty much nonstop for 15 years, and I'd never experienced anything like it, where everyone just went home and crying. I, I wanted to know what exactly, what do you, what do you mean? You know, how, how, how? I was angry really angry. And for them to overlook something that jeopardizes the safety of the people that are working with them is absolutely, positively, it's unacceptable. Ever since the accident on February 20th, investigators have been trying to figure out who wasn't doing their job to keep this crew safe. The people who made poor choices that day need to be held fully accountable. Investigators would uncover this email sent to location manager Charlie Baxter on the morning of the shoot, in which the railroad refuses to grant the film permission to shoot on its tracks. Producer director Randall Miller and the rest of the Midnight Rider crew had no way of knowing when a train might be coming, as railroad safety expert and film consultant Art Miller notes. There is no freight train schedule I can rely on to make sure there'll be no train on my track. It's a day-to-day -day thing. There's not such a thing as a freight train schedule that approximates what, say, a major airline might publish. Someone at the scene apparently said only two trains go by, we're good to go. Well, that's not true. Attorney Jeff Harris has filed a lawsuit on behalf of Sarah Jones's parents. You don't shoot on a railroad track unless you absolutely are positive that you have permission to be there. And I think they said, well, you know, we don't have actual permission, but ultimately we're just going to try to steal the shot. If so, it would apparently not be the first time Randall Miller had stolen a shot. Take the subway scene from his 2013 movie CBGB, a scene he brought up in this panel discussion. We're not allowed to shoot in the New York subway, so I don't know if you know that, but you're not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> and on the DVD extras from CBGB, shot mostly in Savannah, Randall Miller jokes about pulling off scenes like this one. This is a real house, and I don't think they fully knew that we were going to drop a piano down their staircase. All in good fun? Well, how about a child turned loose in a pasture? I mean, I don't think it's dangerous at all to have a little kid run through cows, do you no, think? No, no, no. One man wasn't laughing. Jay Self, then the head of the Savannah Film Commission. We had more complaints about the activities of this film than we did in any previous entire year. Self, who would be removed from his post after CBG left town by the Chamber of Commerce, says that a stop sign was removed by the production, another painted over. Cars were parked in handicap spots or in front of fire hydrants. Minor issues, perhaps, but often accompanied, Self says, by sheer arrogance. He would say, but we're trying to make a movie here, as if that somehow outweighed the safety 
or the welfare or the business of other people. It was like that some kind of magic card. When CBGB was over, we were like, I can't believe nobody got hurt. Tragically, that was not the case on Midnight Rider. They thought they could make up their own rules. They pushed it too far. The audacity to put someone else's life in, in, in such danger. They wanted to get the shot, so whatever it took to get the shot is what they did. The entire crew was put in a situation where we all had to basically run for our lives. It's true, as shown by this startling new evidence just released today. Dramatic video taken by a camera mounted inside CSX Q12519. It shows the Midnight Rider crew racing off the bridge as the train that would need a mile of track to stop rapidly approaches the bed that's been left behind on one of the rails. Look again and listen as the dramatic scene unfolds. 26 seconds before impact, the engineer starts to blare the horn continuously. Three seconds before impact, it's too late to get the bed off the tracks. It sits there, while to the side, actors William Hurt and Wyatt Russell, along with two crew members, make it off the trestle. One second before impact, people cover their ears, clinging to the bridge for their lives. On impact, the bed becomes a deadly weapon. The train hits the bed, and the bed flies up, and apparently a portion of the hospital bed strikes Sarah and pushes her into the train. Hairstylist Joyce Gilliard suffered a compound fracture of her left arm. She's had to have a plate put in and is also suing the producers, the railroad company, and nearby landowners. It's not just my arm that was hurt. I suffered such a traumatic experience seeing my coworker, friend, lose her life because of someone else's negligence. Up next, in the hot seat, in court and on video, the man at the center of the Sarah Jones tragedy, producer-director Randall Miller, confronted with different questions about just what happened that day, and giving the same answer three times. Unfortunately, that's not my job. You know where anybody was down that track before that train accident occurred. Again, it's not my job. You didn't ask CSX how many trains were coming down that trussle, did you? Again, that's not my job. 2020 continues. Here again, Chris Connolly. 27-year-old Sarah Jones was doing her job. Part of the Midnight Rider crew, instructed to place their equipment and a metal bed on these railroad tracks. Only to see a train coming towards them at 57 miles per hour, and smashing into the bed. The train hit the bed. It sent shrapnel flying everywhere, and she was hit. The shrapnel hit, apparently hit her and caused her to knock, knock her into the train. Flying County 911. Can you get my location where I am? I, I think we need, a, we need an ambulance. Well, someone got hit by a train. Seven crew members suffered injuries in the accident. Sarah Jones lost her life. It's clear that certainly the producers and director, they messed up, they messed up real bad. It was a live track. There were tracks elsewhere in the vicinity that were not live tracks that could have been used. 2020 found a train trestle just a few hours away, where an on-site railroad official was able to shut down train traffic so we could film safely. You go on a railroad track without permission, there's a walk, big spectrum of what could happen. If the spectrum goes all the way to somebody dies, you just don't do it. Joyce Gilliard was recuperating when producer-director Randall Miller paid her a visit. He came to my hospital room a couple days after the tragedy happened. He didn't say anything, he just cried. He just cried. The Wayne County DA has charged Randall Miller and three other members of the Midnight Rider team with involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter carries a maximum of 10 years. They've each pleaded not guilty. Everybody is trying to distance themselves from responsibility, saying it was not their fault. 
Finally, there are words from the man at the center of the tragedy, Randall Miller, testifying in a civil suit filed against him by Greg Allman, the subject of Midnight Rider, and saying one phrase three times. Did you even employ anyone to go down the railroad track, maybe three or four miles down, to warn people of when the train was coming? Unfortunately, that's not my job. Do you know where anybody was down that track before that train accident occurred? Again, it's not my job. You didn't ask CSX how many trains were coming down that trussle, did you? Again, that's not my job. Recalling the final warning that was given to his crew. I heard that if a train were to come, that at the very least we'd have 60 seconds. Did you actually believe that you could get a metal bed off the track and the people off the track in 60 seconds? Well, I didn't. claiming he'd gotten the okay for his shoot from a company that owns land next to the tracks. Do you have a written permission, sir, to be on the train track? We have permission from Rainier who gave us the permission to be there. The company Rainier owned the land next to the tracks, but not the tracks themselves, which is where the deadly shoot occurred. Did you have written permission from CSX, the railroad company, to be on that track? I'm not the one that I was in the middle of the track, and I almost died. Sarah Jones did die on those tracks. A statement released tonight to 2020 from the lawyer of Randall Miller and his wife, producer Jody Savin, says they believed they had permission to be on the tracks from Rainier and CSX. They had no reason to believe that anyone would be placed in danger. They will live with the sorrow of Sarah's death for the rest of their lives. Her death sent shockwaves through the filmmaking community, as nothing else had, since a helicopter killed three actors, two of them young children, during the 1982 filming of The Twilight Zone, the movie. Anita Bush and Jen Yamato of Deadline.com have been on top of the story from the start. The one thing that the Twilight Zone incident did do is it's helped safety issues for children and for child labor laws. I think we're seeing the same thing for safety on the set with Midnight Rider and Sarah Jones. People will not forget Sarah Jones. Days afterwards, hundreds of film and TV productions across the nation began to put Sarah Jones's name on their slates. From Scandal and The Big Bang Theory to Downton Abbey and Mad Men, all to reinforce the importance of on the set safety and to honor her memory. This was personally given to us by uh, Nina Dobrev of The Vampire Diaries. I think latest count were, was 2,000 slates. The slates for Sarah have a special place in the home of Sarah's parents, who were watching as the Oscars paid tribute. When you saw her name up on the screen at the Academy Awards, what were your feelings? Overwhelming. She made it to the Academy. She made it. Yeah. Earlier this month, heartened by news that there's now a smartphone app for crew members to get back up on safety issues, hundreds took part in a safety walkathon in Atlanta. Never again let someone's daughter die. Those in attendance included Sarah's family and the Vampire Diaries cast and crew. In my head, she's always walking by me with this smile, and I'm in a bad mood, and all of a sudden, I'm instantly in a good mood. Nowhere is her memory more cherished than on the Vampire Diaries set, where the first shot of the day is called the Jonesy as a safety reminder. The first shot is dedicated to Sarah Jones. Here we go, the Jonesy's up. Jonesy B. Mark. The last day I ever saw Sarah, we were, we'd rented some bikes and we're just bombing around uh, Amsterdam and had just the best time together. I feel as blessed as I do that my memories of her are, are so positive and so wonderful. We feel so blessed to have had a daughter, to have had her for 27 years, was wonderful. That trial is set for early next year, and we want to know, have you ever been put in danger by your boss? We hope you'll tweet us tonight. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And when we come back here, what happens when you call 911 and they hang up on you? You've got to hear this. Coming up, it's one of the most stressful jobs on the planet. 911. But that's no excuse for this. I really just don't give a what happened. When 911 hangs up on you, we'll be right back. 
Our lives are in their hands when we most need help, and almost every time they do their utmost to save us. But what happens when first responders don't respond? Jim Avila with the incredible story. They are supposed to be, and most of the time are, our lifelines. The people who, when we are in danger, literally answer the call. Just like Halle Berry in the Hollywood movie, The Call. 911, where's your emergency? I'm trying to break into my house. I'm but old. what if we are in trouble and they are sleeping? Like the 911 operator in Miami, Florida, who was taking a snooze in the dispatch center, and her colleagues also fast asleep. The police department says they were officially on break. But what about this dispatcher in Rockville, Maryland? So tired, he's actually caught on tape snoring. Could you send any um, ambulance or anything right now? Sleeping, clearly not okay. What about dancing? Like this EMT who was driving his ambulance home at the time, reprimanded for his hands-off-the-wheel seat dance to Rihanna's Pour It Up. The singer tweeted, the paramedic guy just reminded me why God sent me here. That sent the video into the Twitterverse stratosphere. All kind of funny, true. But unfortunately, sometimes when first responders are instead worst responders, there can be tragic, not funny at all results. Wow, 13209 rolling in an avenue outside in the parking lot. All right, we got, we got, bear with me on the line. Here is where that call came from. Medrick Mills, a Washington, D.C. Parks employee for nearly five decades, taking his daughter Marie to the computer store to buy a laptop. But this happy sojourn turned into a 911 disaster when Medrick suffered a heart attack. You're walking out of the computer store. And yes. He's right around he's here. He's right around here. And he kind of falls next to the... Falls next to the car, yes. If you're going to suffer a heart attack, it appeared Medrick Mills had picked a pretty good spot to do it. First of all, his daughter was close by, and then, luck of all luck, right across the street, engine house 26 of the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. But as the seconds tick by, that firehouse remains strangely quiet. I mean, the fire department is across the street. Yeah, we understand that. We're going to have a way, okay? What's going on in the firehouse filled with life-saving equipment is hard to fathom and impossible to explain. Because although there are five firefighters inside, none comes across the street to help. In fact, the lieutenant in charge, instead of immediately getting out of her bunk, asked for the exact address of where Medrick was dying not 100 yards away. Another firefighter came outside, but did nothing more than gaze at the chaos across the street. So you're actually going like this. I'm waving my arms because I know, I, I just know that he's seeing me because he's standing with his arms folded, looking this direction. And to her horror, he turned around and went back inside. So how long would it take for emergency personnel to get from here, the firehouse, to there, the parking lot where Medrick Mills was dying of a heart attack? It took me less than 30 seconds to cross that street on foot, but on the day poor Medrick lay here, a full 11 minutes after the first call, paramedics had still not arrived. But as bad as that was on this terrible day, there was a second critical error. The ambulance that was dispatched was initially sent to the wrong address. So where were the paramedics? Let's take a drive. It turns out they've been sent to the wrong side of town, two and a half miles away from where Medrick Mills collapsed. A day of botched signals and no excuse inaction, the Washington, D.C. Fire Department won't even try to justify. When someone knocks on the door and says there's an incident across the street, they should have responded immediately. Does it bother you that one of them actually went back to the bunks and was studying? Yes, that was even more horrendous. The lieutenant who wouldn't initially leave her bunk retired with full pension. The most anyone else got was a 60-hour suspension. That's right, 60 hours. You're so upset, I don't want to hang up with you. I want you to stay out here with me. There is no doubt first responders have stressful jobs. They get hammered with ridiculous calls, supersized complaints about the price of a burger. Okay, what's going on there? I was at a McDonald's. I paid $10, and these guys gave me one burger and a fry. Sir, this is not a police matter. I got robbed for my money. The 911 operator wasn't loving that. I'd say the vast majority of them are not 
technically emergencies, probably 75%. A steady diet of silly calls and other people's genuine trauma forced former 911 operator Jeff Hewitt to quit, he says, after only four and a half years on the job. Still, he says, there's no excuse for what happened in Nashville, Tennessee, during this call for help from a woman being threatened by a knife-wielding boyfriend. Wait for it. I really just don't give a what happens. Yeah. 911 operators are trained to be the responsible party during an emergency, but sometimes they're not. So what can you do? In Tampa, Florida, this mom calls 911 after accidentally locking her toddler in the car during a heat wave. Hi, um, my infant son is locked in the car in a parking lot. Cops on the way, right? No. The dispatcher somehow needed to hear more distress. They won't be able to, to, to try to get gain access to the car unless the child is in some kind of distress. The toddler finally rescued by a motorist who took a wrench to the window. The baby's okay. The dispatcher is now in the hot seat. The dispatcher absolutely made a mistake. This is not the way we do business. In Michigan, this 911 operator, suspended for two weeks without pay, teaches us that no matter how long you have to wait for an ambulance, don't swear, as this desperate daughter did while watching her father's brain seizure. Get the beeps ready. 911. I need an, I need an ambulance and drive heart rate. Well, okay, first of all, you don't need to swear over 911. Okay. And slow down. Ambulance. But the dispatcher had already hung up on her, so she called a second time, and still 911 refused to send help. 911. Are you going to give me an ambulance? Are you going to swear problem? again, you stupid? Are we going to have a huh? problem? No, you're Are not going to have a problem? one. The burnout rate for dispatchers is typically three years. Most people don't make it beyond that. And finally, this tongue-in-cheek insight from our insider. The next time a 911 call is in order, have your emergency Monday morning. Because by Friday, the stress has reached epic proportions for dispatchers. It was just almost unbearable stress. What you have to do is kind of compartmentalize your frustration and your anger because nobody calls you on the best day of their life and say, oh, great, thank you, yeah, 911. For Marie Mills, who lost her dad, she has no advice, just a simple request for the first responders who did not live up to their name. Just do what you were trained to do, what you are supposed to do. Just do your job. Just incredible waving to those first responders across the street not getting help. Tweet us, use the hashtag ABC2020 if something like this has ever happened to you. And up next here, if someone at work says, I'm just exhausted. Wait until you hear this. The sharks from Shark Tank are here with a message for your complaining co-workers. When we come back, just resting their eyes. From movie stars to news anchors. Is falling asleep on the job the new normal? Not to the Shark Tank team. I'd rather be tired than broke. You won't believe how this HR professional thinks you should nap. That's just heartbreaking. Don't when do your job continues. Well, you knew this was coming because we've all seen it. Coworkers sleeping on the job, caught nodding off. What's their excuse? Well, you're about to hear it here tonight. And Chris Conley hearing from the Sharks on Shark Tank. They've got a message you can deliver to your coworkers come Monday morning. There's no greater risk to your career than falling asleep on the job. For Shark Tank's Robert Herjavec, who's amassed a hundred million dollars in his waking hours, downtime at the office is unheard of. You don't get to be a shark by snoozing. If you snooze, you lose. Yet for today's overworked employee, not getting enough sleep can really take a toll, even if he can't. Hey! Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine. Good morning. Even movie stars plugging their own films sometimes need an unexpected rest, like on the Seattle Morning Show. It's a quite a wondrous thing to sit there. We were in the audience last night. And remarkably, live news anchors have been caught snoozing. Carry on with the Such as this one from the BBC. And this radio host didn't drop the mic, he dropped onto it. Even law enforcement isn't immune. This surfaced this week on our San Francisco station KGO. A trucker found this park ranger sawing wood with a beverage accomplice. There's a state park guy here and I can't wake the guy up. 
and not even being photographed could wake up this alleged burglar who catnapped his way into custody after the homeowner's house cleaner found him clasping the sack of jewels while bagging some Z's. 911. There's a man laying on the bed. I'm scared. Please hurry so we can touch him. Falling asleep on the job doesn't usually get you arrested. He's pled not guilty, but it can get you fired or teased on TV. Oh, we bored the scoreboard operator to sleep. Yep, sorry, pal. Your supervisor will be calling you shortly. It's worse for time zone crisscrossing politicians expected to be ever alert, waiting to speak or listening to a speech. Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley nodded off during a meeting with constituents. Tracy Eno says she had spent weeks preparing a speech opposing a natural gas export facility. Hazardous properties. Yeah, I was really excited to be there because I thought finally, you know, here's the opportunity to get the message across. Then it occurred to me, he's dozing off. I was really angry. Hello, you know, wake up here. <laughs> Pay attention to me now. At the time, O'Malley's spokesperson told Maryland's Daily Record he was listening intently during the six-hour meeting. And he's only human. Recent sleep studies would open anyone's eyes. Getting enough sleep improves cognition, memory, and creativity. Great, but what about, you know, money? Overachieving entrepreneurs like the Shark Tank crew insist that advocates for getting seven to nine hours of bed rest a night are full of sheets. There isn't enough hours in a day for me to get the stuff I need done, so I train myself to sleep four hours a night. Anybody can do it. You work kind of 24-7. You sleep because you need to and you have to. I'd rather be tired than broke. In short, do your bleeping job. But for the rest of us, lack of sleep can seem like a permanent component of any job these days. I look around here and I think, this is the perfect workspace the 21st century, right? <laughs> How sleepy are we? There was a, an HR study that recently just called like it an kinda, epidemic. Just like kinda, just, just <laughs> Cynthia Shapiro, a former human resources executive turned career coach and author, is wise in the ways of today's high-powered companies and says some of them want you sleep deprived and work obsessed. She cautions, even if they provide a nap room for the weary, be wary. Don't use them. It's a trap. It's a trap. In order to use it safely, it has to be a super obvious work-related reason. So everyone in the company needs to know that you just got off a red flight or you had you were up all night doing a presentation. That sounds like more work than just staying up. I agree. Some people fall asleep for health or medical reasons, but no matter what the cause, Cynthia suggests if you got a doze, Get out of Dodge. The best thing to do is get out. Tell your boss you forgot about a dentist appointment or you have to go pick something up, run an errand. Go sleep in your car. You're going to drive your <laughs> car somewhere drive into your anonymous car a parking couple, lot? Yes. Sleep in that sleep parking Sleep in lot? your car. Set an alarm do so you don't oversleep. That's just hard. Don't let them see you sleeping. But what if you just can't get away? Well, Cynthia okay, Shapiro so showed me a canny, tongue-in-cheek cubicle cover-up to disguise drowsiness. Remember the governor listening intently? Let's call this the ponder. You want to have some important papers in front of you. You basically put your head um, on your hand and make sure it's pretty secure. And then you can close your eyes. And if someone, you know, comes up and says, Chris, what are you doing? Oh, I was pondering. I was deep in thought. Yeah, these numbers, they got to add up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. But a handful of companies fully embrace the idea that their employees need to be refreshed. Time to shut the engines down for a little bit. Google's nap pods are a popular perk, at least in the movies. What would I do without these babies? And Ariana Huffington, who sold her Huffington Post to AOL for $315 million, is a big advocate of a good night's rest. Sleep your way to the top touting the upside of downtime. Being busy, being always on, has been seen as a badge of honor. That is changing. You know why? Because I feel so good after eight hours sleep, and I enjoy my day. And it turns out that even sharks need a little shut-eye. You don't know how to run a company. You don't know how to preempt the competition. Sure you don't I do. know how to compete. When Mark Cuban caught fellow shark Kevin O'Leary catnapping, he pounced. No. That's just wrong. I took a picture and I, and I Instagrammed it out of Kevin falling asleep. At, yeah. So, yeah, Kevin's definitely a napper. The truth comes out.
on this Halloween night, your children likely already into their candy, or maybe you're eating their candy. Anything with dark chocolate and almonds. You're but David, it. you're pretty good looking for a pumpkin. For a pumpkin, right? Yeah, you know. I, I don't know. I think your hair's a little better than mine there. I don't know. You're better impressive. in a pumpkin than I am. <laughs> Trust me. Again, great to have you back. On. Good to be back. I'm David New York. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas for all of us at 2020. Happy Halloween and have a great night.